Hi everyone. I'm here a tiny bit early waiting for people to come on. I want to make sure that I give ample time if you're joining me now. Um, make sure that you have one of these with you because in a little while we're going to do some actual writing exercises. So have a journal handy and um, just want to say thanks for joining me. It's Friday. I hope you also maybe brought a beverage of choice. Could be coffee, could be tea, whatever your pleasure is. Um, it's nice to see all of you. Happy Friday. We made it here. Cheers. Uh -huh. I hope everyone's doing all right. I think, excuse me, if you're anything like me, it's like everything is moment to moment. Yes, bring a glass of wine, Erwin, Susie. Um, I have moments where I feel really positive and hopeful and other moments where I'm totally lost and frustrated and irritable and I think that's all of us right now. And anyone who's a parent who's also trying to become an impromptu teacher, it sucks. Uh, let's be honest, <laughs> it's, uh, it's challenging to say uh, the least. So what I wanted to do tonight was, for those of you who aren't familiar with my book, I wanted to tell you a little bit about the book and why I started it, but also read a few pieces that I, I hope are really timely right now. When I was writing the book, obviously it was years ago, I wasn't thinking of uh, life beyond what was normal at that point in time. Um, so uh, yeah, but right now it feels like more than ever, there's something really interesting about the fact that uh, people seem to need tiny joys more than ever. And particularly like a shout out right now to frontline workers who, um, you know, I've heard from a number of you and I'm just thinking of you and I do think you need tiny indulgences really like to get you through this. So um, a little bit about the book, uh, for those of you who don't know, it is called Find Your Pleasure, The Art of Living a More Joyful Life. Here it is. This photograph was taken by my good friend and um, an amazing photographer named Alkin Eamon. He's on uh, Instagram. He's taken some incredibly gorgeous pictures of Jan Arden. Hi, Jan, who's on here as well. And Arlene Dickinson. He's an incredible talent. Check him out. And yeah, he took this po photograph of me ages ago. And then um, the amazing people at Simon & Schuster, they, uh, they saw it and they were like, it's perfect. Let's use it as the cover. So I was like, yes. And for me, pleasure is, is both about the big grand vision of our lives and the way in which we see our lives and our goals and, and seeking out that inner voice that tells us where we should go, but also about those small little tiny things, the way in which we tap into our senses. It's about living more sensually, being aware of what we touch, taste, smell, hear. And, um, and those are the things I think that really also ground us. And so without further ado, I just do want to say that I think that pleasure is not a luxury and it, it isn't necessarily some kind of weird slippery slope to ruin. I think if you actually do a deep dive and I talk about this in the book is there's actually tons of health benefits to being in touch with um, what brings you deep pleasure and understanding it. And, and yeah, and being more present as Jan said right now. Thank you for that. So, okay, I'm going to read you one of the pieces um, that I think is actually quite important um, because the things that I'm going to talk to you about are either going to be hopefully inspiring you to think differently today or in the couple days going forward. Um, or maybe, um, I don't know, maybe it's going to make you cultivate something you haven't thought about. So this one is called Love Letters. And um, I'm just going to read. So growing up, my mother was the main lunch maker in our household. Most of her lunches were forgettable. A little bologna here, a wiener and hot water thermos there. But one day she did something different. As I sat down with my friends at school for lunch, I was delighted to discover that nest to discover that nestled in between the juice box and the cookies was a little folded love note. I don't remember exactly what it said, something simple like, I love you, have a great day. And I don't know what inspired this tiny gesture, but the impact was huge. Since then, I've written and received many love letters. In fact, I have a box filled with handwritten notes, some from young men filled with angst and desire, others from wonderful friends I don't get to see enough, and of course, ones from my son written in jagged letters. Looking through them is a visual and tactile experience that conjures up pleasure-soaked memories. There's nothing wrong with a letter written in electronic form. There's also the added bonus of being able to add in a saucy, silly emoji or a voice note for your lovers and loved ones to listen to. 
but there's something extra special about handwriting something to someone you care about. So pick up a pen today and tell someone you love them. It doesn't take much to make someone's day go from mundane to magical. We've actually been experimenting with writing letters with Jaya and he's been learning about it in school and about the way in which you're supposed to construct a proper letter. So I do think there's something so important and so like tiny about that. Um, we've been fantasizing and this could be like a little maybe inspiring idea of doing a kind of community like love bomb and leaving little notes randomly for people. Ideally, like we're looking for plantable paper right now. So if you guys have any leads, but I'd love to write some little notes on plantable paper and leave them in, in um, the neighborhood just for people to come across. So there's an idea for you guys. I'm going to move on to another piece. Okay, hold on. How's everyone doing anyway? Just, I'm going to try to read uh, from here, but then also read your comments afterwards. So let's write it. Let's uh, read a piece that I think also is important for right now, which is um, letting go. Again, for those of you just joining, reminder: I'm reading from my book, Find Your Pleasure. But I also want you to guys to grab a notebook if you can, and like a writing utensil that you love to write with, and we'll do a couple of exercises after. So this piece is called Letting Go. Life is a constant exercise in letting go. We all grow up with expectations of who we're going to become, but rarely do those dreams come to pass exactly as we thought. And if we hang on to old hopes, bad decisions, or past injuries that can steal our pleasure. So here are some ideas to help you move beyond the past. Number one, visualize. If you think about how things should be or should have been, take a deep breath and visualize a box labeled expectations, and then mentally put those thoughts in that box. Two, decide what's important. Instead of thinking of all the things you'd like to say or do if you only could, how about use your energy to make changes that you really want or let those desires go? Three, take responsibility. Growing up, whenever I came home uh, upset about something, my mother would always ask, which at the time I will say drove me crazy, but where is your responsibility in this? That always made me angry, but then I realized she was teaching me something, that when I was focused on a perceived injustice rather than what I could have done differently, I was giving away my power. Four, throw it away. Emotional baggage is hard to throw away, but if you do, you'll find you have much more room to grow. Is there a memory that's causing you stress? Write it down and burn the pages. Physically removing a symbol of that emotional turmoil will help you move on to experience new pleasures. And lastly, transform your narrative. Maybe you're still harboring bitterness towards a lover who hurt you. Instead of focusing on that pain, remind yourself that you would have never recognized the positive traits in your current love or your current life if you hadn't gone through that experience. That one, that last one, transforming your narrative. I was actually on a podcast recently and I was talking about how important it is to transform your narrative. And the example that we were talking about was, and I hear women say this a lot, that like, I can't function if my house isn't clean. And so right now, being that we're all generally living in our homes and creating extra mess because our families are home all the time, I think it's caused an extra layer of stress. And I'm not saying that I don't agree. I, I function better when my house is very minimalist and clean, but I'm living in a lot of clutter right now, I'll just be honest, and a lot of chaos. And so if I continue to tell myself the narrative that I can't create when my space is messy or I can't function, then I'm creating all this added stress and I'm contributing to a narrative and therefore making it true. What if instead, when we're feeling like this, and this is what I've been actually trying to do more and more, is, is saying, no, I create things and I can function no matter where I am. Again, it's a tiny thing, but if we, instead of telling ourselves that one narrative is true, look, we do make it true when we tell ourselves that. So instead, if we constantly say to ourselves, you know, listen, uh, it's okay, I'm gonna live in mess for a little while, I'm still gonna be happy. Or listen, things are gonna be a bit chaotic the next little while, unforeseen future, I'm still the person who creates stuff and I can still do that despite what my surroundings look like. It's just a suggestion, just maybe try it out. Um, one of the things I wanted to share with you that has been a hugely pleasurable activity that I've been doing on a day-to-day -day basis, and I, and I would love to hear what you're doing to keep yourself indulged and, and feeling pleasure-filled, um, is that every night before bed, I choose a memory. Um, and usually they're involving travel, and usually they're involving friends, and I will do a deep dive, and I will try to remember every single detail about it. So let's say it's a trip, and it's to the Caribbean or something, 
I will picture myself taking those first tentative steps onto a beach and the feel of the sand in my toes and the smell of like coconut oil in the air and the taste of the sip of a first like margarita. And I'll go through this whole thing about the conversations that I might have had or the dinner that I had or the concert that I went to. And, and the more that I, that I really go deep in that, it's like I, I was there again, that I'm reliving it. And I think, um, I think that that's a really like just nice way of reflecting and remembering. Sometimes it helps to have like pictures nearby to do that deep dive. But um, so guys, can you share the title of the book you were reading at the beginning? Well, it's my own book. It's called Find Your Pleasure, The Art of Living a More Joyful Life. Um, someone asked a quick question I just saw pop by, which was, uh, can you talk about a favorite guest on the show? And uh, there have been so many guests who've brought me great pleasure on the show. Um, probably you, though, who watch the show know that Jason Momoa was a highlight of my life. I'd met him before. I'd done a few interviews with him before. and um, But he was a treat. And I, of course, I talked about him a lot on the show. So the producer decided to embarrass me on the show by showing a, a, a montage of all the times that I talked about him in um, sort of <laughs> highly suggestive ways. So that was funny. He was a real good sport about it. Um, but other people like Emma Thompson was amazing. Uh, Sir Patrick Stewart was incredible. Ryan Reynolds, who's just been doing, I've been so loving watching him do all these incredible things for frontline workers and, you know, raising money. And he still maintains a sense of humor, which I think we need. Um, oh, somebody's asking, do you ever need space from your, uh, son and husband being all cooped up together? Yes, I do. Yes, I go for walks when I can, um, and I adore them. But I think, like everything else, like even your best, uh, your your best people around you are going to get on your nerves. We're all living on top of each other, so I try to take time to just go for a walk, sit on, you know, on outside. I need that. And now that the weather's getting nicer, I think that's going to be a bit easier. Um, Guys, thanks again for being here. Grab a journal if you haven't. I'm reading from my book, Find Your Pleasure, The Art of Living a More Joyful Life, hopefully to give you some inspiration, some ideas of things you can do that cost nothing, things that you can reflect on and will hopefully like mine yourself for little pleasure treasures. Um, okay, so uh, this next one I'm going to read is called In Praise of Slow. And if there's anything this pandemic has taught us is that we need to slow the F down. Um, so this is this piece. Do less. It was a message a friend of mine put on her social media. It stood out because it was so counter to all the other messages I saw. Let's face it, we live in a fast food world. We celebrate multitaskers who always rush around. Yet our world of faster and more creates habits that are neither good for our planet nor lend themselves to pleasure. The simple instruction to do less reminded me of a time when I traveled to a sleepy town in Spain and ordered a cafe con leche to go. The barista looked at me and asked, ¿Qué? then gave me my coffee in a porcelain mug. At first I was slightly miffed, but as I sat in a rickety chair in an old building and started to take in the sights and the smells and the sounds around me, I realized I would have missed all of that if I'd just walked out the door with my coffee. And that planted a seed in my heart, a tiny radical way to embrace pleasure. Start getting things to stay. Sit and sip your coffee, eat your meal slowly, relish your wine and savor that dessert. Then how about apply this idea to, of slow to other parts of your life? Try slow parenting. How about slow sex? When you start to slow down, when you embrace doing less, that's when the real pleasures of life start to reveal themselves. And then I have a little prompt here. I should be showing you these pictures. This is a picture of coffee. This is the book. And then there's a little indulge yourself um, at the bottom. And I say, uh, stay in your pajamas all day and binge watch the shows you love. Hands up if you've been staying in your pajamas some days all day. Uh, uh, uh. I've also been letting my son do that, and that's it's fraught with a lot of feelings. Um, and I'm trying to, as uh, as I talk about in the book a lot, I really reject this idea of guilt. And I think we all do this to ourselves, and we feel guilty about our pleasures, and we feel guilty about, you know, there's all mother guilt. There's all these kinds of heavy weighted guilt, and and I think we have to make active choices to reject them. And I'm not perfect at it. Um, I've been feeling, if I'm being perfectly honest, a little bit bad because teaching has been hard and some days my son doesn't get out of his pajamas. I'm not sure he's brushed his teeth today. So, uh, but then I just kind of think he's still filled with joy. He's happy. He's happy he's got his parents around right now. And he's happy to just kind of, uh, I feel like I'm getting the maternity leave I never had. And I think he may look back at this time and find it to be really, really 
um, interesting uh, and, and maybe joyful, maybe interesting memories. The page someone was asking, the page I was reading from right there in praise of slow was 2.15. Um, so speaking of uh, ideas and inspiration, uh, this one's on page for those of you who are following along in the book. Um, this is on page 49 and it's called the Zen of mess. This kind of goes along with what we were talking about earlier on. Here we go. Life is messy. Sometimes there are piles of laundry and the bed isn't made. And there are days when the dirty dishes are stacked in the sink and crumbs and sticky bits dot, dot the counter. While mess definitely can have a negative impact on mood, one of the biggest pleasure killers in life is obsessively focusing on this. I know so many women who will forgo sensual delights because they feel like they need to clean up. Instead, remember that your path to bliss includes thinking about yourself and your needs. So when you need for help, ask for it. But to start you off, here are some useful ways to approach mess. One, reframe things. Instead of seeing an unmade bed, I'm sitting on an unmade bed, I feel like. Instead of sitting, seeing an unmade bed and getting upset, remind yourself of the wonderful sleep you had. When you come across a dirty sink, promise yourself to a treat uh, when you're finished cleaning it. Instead of despairing at the sight of dirty dishes, remember the wonderful meal you shared with a friend. Two, set the stage for pleasure. Put on some music or a podcast you love and allow your mind to wander as you clean. Or try to be fully present. Feel the warm water as you wash dishes. Focus on textures as you organize a closet. Three, carve out space. Designate somewhere in your home that's yours and yours alone. This is hard, I know, for some people with very small spaces, but maybe sometimes it's going to be like a mental space or just an area. Um, and that space will always be cleaned and organized as you like, so you can retreat there as things be if things become overwhelming in other spaces. And four, escape to outside. Go for a brisk walk. Nature can be cluttered and messy, and yet it's still beautiful, wild and ever-changing. So instead of seeing your space as a chaotic disaster, view it as lush and alive, a potent reminder of all the pleasurable things in life that you've been focusing on instead. For people asking, this is my book. It's uh, Find Your Pleasure, The Art of uh, Living a More Joyful Life. Um, so yeah, so I'm just reading from that. And I also, one of the great things that uh, we did during my book tour um, that I feel so grateful and thankful that I got m through most of um, is that I partnered with Indigo for a number of events and um, we did these little great workshops where we took out some parts of my book and got people to, in real time, write down some of the things, the exercises. And they were really meaningful and people shared incredible stories of, of um, things that they were reflecting on. I heard from a number of women who had an empty nest and even uh, marriages dissolving later on in life. And, and they realized that they'd been so long living in service to family members, to um, being caregivers, that they had no idea what they even liked when just in those quiet moments alone, they didn't know what they liked to do. And one of the things I always suggest for people, if they're, if they're kind of struggling, like, they're like, what is it that I like to do in my spare time? Um, is to think of something that you really enjoyed when you were a child uh, or something that, you know, if you ask yourself this question, what would I do if I had a completely unscheduled day? Or what would I do if money was no object? These are some like little indicators that can poke you into understanding, you know, maybe, maybe where things uh, that stir your passion live. Um, yeah, I'm, as I'm saying this, I'm going to take a sip of this. Uh, but also, take a sip of this. Anyone else doing this right now? Anyone? <laughs> Someone wrote that when they were a child, they loved watching documentaries. And I ask you, what documentaries are you watching now? Because I would love to know. There are some great ones out there. Cheers to everyone. Um, the book was in, tour was not just in the Toronto area. I went to... Um, many places in southern Ontario. I went to London. I went to uh, Water or Kitchener Waterloo. I went to um, Oakville. I also went to um, Calgary, and I went to Edmonton. I didn't come to Montreal. I wish I had of, and I really wish I had gone also to the East Coast. Um, yeah, those were they're still on my list. And obviously, when things are a bit more normal, what was in the mason jar? Water. Uh, <laughs> 
Um, but they were great and I, I had the honor, I was so lucky because Marcy Ian hosted um, one of them, Jess Allen hosted one, um, Jan Arden hosted one, so it was really wonderful. The Bethany Hamilton doc on Netflix was great. Oh, I heard there's also a new documentary on Netflix about these two women who've been lovers, were lovers, secret lovers. Has anyone seen this one? I, 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 it's on my list of things to see. So, oh, I love that somebody's on their balcony with wine right now. I'm just, I love it. I, yes, I will come to Montreal when I can. Have you seen a good movie recently? No, because I haven't had the bandwidth for movies. So I will share that one of the things that I have, I used to play a lot of video games before having children and now there's a lot of video games going on in my house and I've discovered a video game that I'm in love with. Maybe some of you are playing it. It's Animal Crossing, it's on the Nintendo Switch. And I feel like that it's kind of the perfect game for um, the pandemic because you're basically on an island and you're building um, this little perfect community and you get to hang out with people and you get to like go fishing and there's no there's no it's not stressful at all the only thing that's stressful is you might encounter like at night a scorpion and then you might pass out but that's it it's quite lovely um someone's watching ozark on netflix i heard that's quite terrifying but if that yeah i saw Tag tiger king i found it very depressing um yeah but i will check that out if you guys recommend it anyway guys thanks again for being here i'm doing some little readings from my book if you're just joining and I hope you have a, one of these nearby because I'm going to move into this um, shortly. Sorry, I lost my pen, but that's okay. Um, okay, here's another one that I'm going to read. Um, especially because right now we are approaching uh, cherry blossom season and none of us are going to be going out to see them, probably. Uh, so this one's called Lessons from Cherry Blossoms. For those of you who don't live in a four season climate, cherry blossom trees represent one of the first signs that spring is officially on. What is extra special about that, uh, sorry, what is extra special about them is that blooming season, while glorious, is very short lived. After the delicate pink or white flowers open, they almost immediately begin to fall, looking like snow on the ground. In the city where I live, there's a park filled with hundreds of cherry blossom trees, so people come from far and wide, normally, to bask in their glory. I hate crowds and I also get anxious easily, but, but recently, when I wrote this, I decided to brave the bustle in order to honor these precious blossoms. I packed up my son along with some picnicky things and headed out. I drove across the city, found parking, and then trekked across the enormous park, only to discover that the blossoms weren't fully open yet. I'll admit, I thought, maybe I would have been better off just admiring something at the garden center or closer to home. But once we were settled, I couldn't help feel, but feel charmed. The park was packed with others who were all out for the same reason, to acknowledge and celebrate the magic of cherry blossoms. I quickly realized that this time-honored tradition isn't really about the incredible beauty of the blossoms at all. What people are drawn to is the fact that these flowers are a reminder of the fragile impermanence of life. It's not surprising that they are hugely popular in Japan. They are a potent metaphor for Buddhist themes like mortality, mindfulness, and living in the present. You can't predict when anything will change. All you can do is try your best to celebrate little moments as if they, like the cherry blossoms, might at any second blow away in the wind. So I think that that's uh, a kind of timely one right now. Um, someone's sharing that they have a magnolia tree and it's just starting to blossom. Oh my God, my magnolias are my favorite. The song Sugar Magnolia by the Grateful Dead is also one of my favorite songs ever, so thank you for mentioning that. Um, yeah, if, if I think if we've learned anything through this pandemic it's that things can change on a dime and um if you're not living your best life or your truest life now i mean now is the time to start thinking seriously all about that um yeah do i have time to do i'm going to do another one of these but then i would love it if you will engage with me okay so here's one more that we're going to do which is the healing power of laughter oh did i show Sorry, hang on for a second. Guys, sorry, I'm all over the place. Um, thanks for your patience. I've never done one of these before, a reading. Dandelions are coming in Halifax, even those make me happy. Oh my gosh, that's beautiful. And hello, thinking of you in Halifax. Um, okay, this one. I, I should have been showing pictures all along. The book is filled with a whole bunch of pictures from my life and pictures that also friends of mine have taken. Um, so, isn't laughter one of the most pleasurable experiences in life? Someone says or does something wacky or you recall a particularly funny memory and you feel the eruption begin. It may start with a smile and evolve into a chuckle and then those deep rhythmic contractions unfold from deep within your belly. 
Before you know it, rivers of tears are streaming down your face and you can do nothing at all but give yourself over to the sheer joy of it all. Laughter has healing properties too. My doula told me to find a comedian who I found funny and to watch videos of him or her performing when I was in early labor with my son. She believes that when we laugh, the deepest parts of ourselves begin to relax and that helps to manage pain. While I won't say my labor was pain-free, it was definitely much more manageable than I ever would have imagined, and in some parts even pleasurable. So how about that? Laughter is a prescription for pleasure. Perhaps it can truly heal the most painful parts of life. Oh, someone's a nurse is writing in. Thank you, thank you for what you do. She's thanking us for staying home. Um, laughter. I, I feel like it's saving me, even though, I mean, you know, in the dark parts of life, you still have to find these kind of moments of, of humor. I've been watching Crave TV has Dave Chappelle, um, the, the, the Chappelle show. And I have been living for his um, impersonations of Rick James and Prince. Um, yeah. And Jaya and I have also found a few things. We watch SpongeBob almost every morning. It's kind of a ritual. And holy shit, that show's funny. And, he, and we get the humor at the exact same time. So there's something amazing. Um, so, okay. So guys, I'm going to shift gears and I'm going to tell you a little bit about what I would love to just do if you're up for it. If you have some, a pen and paper nearby, if not, just run and grab one right now. Um, so the book is filled, as I mentioned, with like little stories and, you know, musings from my life and photographs and, but also with these um, little pleasure prompts, like ideas um, for things to write about and to kind of get you thinking. So I would love it if we could do it together. So I'm going to start with this one and I'll do it at the same time right now. So this is the first, first pleasure prompt. Uh, and can I just talk a minute? This is not what I wanted to write with. I'm very particular about what I write with. And I feel like it's, it's very um, important that you choose things you like, but I lost my pen that I enjoy. I don't know where it went to right now because my room is a mess. So um, we're going to do this anyway. So the first pleasure prompt I'm going to start with uh, is, so there's been lots of research to show that there's something very important about us putting our experiences on paper. And if you haven't started a journal during this, it's worth thinking about doing. Um, I haven't because I have my website and I've been writing other stuff thinking ahead, but I do think it's important and cathartic to put your feelings down on paper. It's something I've been doing also with Jaya as well. Um, so I, I want you to do this as we're speaking and I don't want you to overthink. I'm going to give you a prompt and I just want you to jot down what you think when I say this, if you can. Okay. I'm going to read you the prompts first and then I'm going to give you some ideas. Okay. They are going to be, I love, I feel, I know, I wish, I plan. Okay. So I'm going to re-ask those. I love, for example, it could be cupcakes, dogs, kids, friends. So start with that. I love. Okay, you ready? Second prompt, I feel. Tell me how you feel right now. Next prompt, I know. What do you know? That you're a good person? That you're, that you're a good parent? What do you know? And I wish, what do you wish for? And how about this last one? I plan, what do you plan to do? Do you guys wanna share any of that as you're going? I'm gonna share mine right now. I love my job, my family, my friends, this country. Those were the things I wrote down. I feel, and it's interesting, before I started this, I was, today I had a good day where I felt really anxious. I had a lot of anxiety today earlier on, but right now I feel, I feel relaxed and I feel happy and that's what's happening. Someone says I love their job. Um, I know, I know things are going to turn out okay. That's what I wrote. I wish that the world learns from this and does better. And I plan to start a journal. <laughs> I gave the advice, so now I got a plan to do that. So those are my 
prompts. So again, that was I love, I feel, I know, I wish, I plan. If you want, these are all written down in my book. Maybe I'll put them up afterwards in case you missed that. So the next thing, again, if you have your journal nearby, let's do this next prompt together. Um, so I talk a lot in the book about body image and the struggles that I've had with the way in which I see myself and how I say things I have in the past said things to myself that I would never say to anybody else. And, um, and then I grew up with a lot of shame and kind of confusion around my body. And it's, it's hard. Our bodies are like a, an always evolving, uh, thing. And so, uh, I thought I should share with you the other day, my son came into my room and he started, he, he started like squishing. He's like, he loves to talk about my body and he appreciates it just as it is. Um, and that got me to thinking about the importance of seeing our, ourselves differently because we would never probably critique someone else's body the way that we critique our own. And, and there's lots of things that are important about what our bodies can do as opposed to what they look like. So I want you, this is your prompt, uh, using the prompt, this body, write down all of the amazing things that your body does for you. Ready? I'm going to write down a few of those things. Are you doing it? Okay. Hi, Derek. Derek is here. I miss Derek. Oh my God. Derek does this amazing thing called the 10 minute talk show. Go and check him out. He's on Instagram and he is, he's of course our, uh, our, um, audience coordinator and he is like this incredible light and, uh, yeah, I'm glad to see you. So things that your body does for you. Okay. For me, I wrote down, it moves, it dances, it smells, tastes, thinks, all the senses things. Um, I mean, think about, I, I also put orgasms like that's why not you, that's important. It's important to throw that out there. Um, it feels pleasure. So, um, no matter what it looks like. Okay. Another pleasure prompt. Uh, and then we're going to start winding down here. Um, I want you to write down and maybe I'm not going to get to all of this. Oh, sorry. Someone's sharing. Uh, mine can bench carry a bench carry its weight and down a flight of stairs. Well, yeah, that's it. I'm someone's cooking while they're listening. I will rewatch later. My Dan answers. Well, thank you for that. Um, someone said, I just got the store. A lady at the store asked, are you expecting? I said, no, she said, sorry. Oh, I know that there's these things. They make us feel terrible about ourselves. And every woman has had this experience. I'll tell you from my, like I, when I started the social, I was breastfeeding and I was very stressed out. And I share this in, in the book. I was actually not well for a lot of it and I lost so much weight and I was always um I knew that my body was never going to stay at that that size and so as I've this is this is where my body should be and yet the scrutiny that it's been under and the things that people have said to me I feel you but I hope you will reflect on on what your body is doing and, and how amazing it is and our bodies are these like ephem like these sh these shape-shifting shells they're never going to stay the same and the idea that we can we try to hang on to one vision of what it should be instead of just like delighting in the pleasures that it can bring to us um makes me sad so I think we all have to shift again it goes back to those narratives we tell ourselves um because we've all seen also people with all kinds of different types of bodies and if they don't have that kind of inner light, it doesn't read the same way. But if they do, it's amazing the impact that that can have. I remember the first time I saw a belly dancer and it was this incredibly curvy woman and she was so hot and I just, it trans, it just shifted something in me forever. So, um, okay. The last little one, again, if you haven't do, oh, are you more body positive now than when the social started? Um, I don't know. I think I, ever since I started belly dancing, I've really thought about it, but it, it changes. It, 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 it's been, uh, it definitely has been, uh, you know, a shifting thing. So, okay, here we go. Here's one we're going to do. I want you to quickly write down the quality. Well, this is not really easy. Actually, you're not going to be able to quickly do this. Maybe we won't get through, through this. Um, one of the things that that I've often thought about is that in order for us to fully enjoy and embrace life, uh, we will be all wise to think a little bit more about death. And it's something that we avoid and it feels uncomfortable. I mean, right now, I think we're talking a little bit and thinking a little bit more about it than ever. 
Um, but what we often don't think about is, is like, what will we want to be remembered for? What will we want people to say about us? And then asking ourselves, like, am I, would people say that about me if it happened tomorrow? Um, so maybe write down a few things that you feel like you would want people to remember you for, describe you after you had gone. I'm writing window. I want to know yours. Um, oh, someone said, do you find that once you enter your forties, you're more comfortable with who you are? Um, yep. And I think that I'm looking forward to that continuing. <laughs> Someone says, I'm singing and dancing. I'm no good at them, but I do it all the time. Me too. Oh, that's Denise. Hi, Denise. Um, what is this? Someone says that I was kind, caring, and loving. That's kind, Laura, that's kind of what I wrote down. Um, someone wrote about their sense of humor, that my was kind and sense of humor, my honesty, good or bad. Yeah, I love that, Sandra. Um, making people feel special. I love that too. Is that Ron? Thanks for that. Um, I hope people, Tam Gauchi says, I hope people will say what I'm passionate about everything I did. Yes. Tracy. Hi, Tracy. I want people to remember my empathy. I think they will. Um, uh, my amazing homemade, homemade bread. That's what Siren says. Um, for me, I wrote down kind, sensitive, thoughtful. Um, and I mean, I, like there are many things that I still want to cultivate in myself and, uh, and be remembered by, you know? Um, someone shared something that's happened to me in high school about death. Everyone said if I died, they would all celebrate and throw a party and be happy. Well, that's just horrible, Justin. I, I, high school is an awful time. <laughs> Let's just face it. Um, this is what people are saying, my laughter, my authenticity. Someone said if I had to eulogize you, I would say Cynthia really listens and cares. Thanks, Laura. I hope so. I, 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 I feel um, so grateful all the time for all of you. And I, and I, I will say we really miss right now. All of us have talked about how much we miss the social and just being in the studio and, um, you know, having a live audience, but also just being back to some sort of normal thing. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's something that we'll get back to. Anyone want to cheers right now? Cool. So you guys, I'm hoping to do more of these regular things. Um, having sort of a focus thing because the book the, the this book um is is a mixed bag of all kinds of different sections around pleasure so i did you know the importance of living and loving and ins inspiration so there's all these different sections so i'm hoping that we can maybe pick one and do like a parenting pleasure party <laughs> and do like a lifestyle pleasure party and do like a sexuality pleasure party so we'll kind of do some of these things together and um, if you guys have any thoughts in, in between now and then, you can always reach me through my website, www.findyourpleasure.com. Um, the emails come right to me, and you can also reach me through Instagram. And um, yeah, I hope you are all planning on enjoying your Friday night and thinking less about um, maybe what's going on in the world. Well, actually, I, sh I should say that Right now, in, in a few minutes, or the vigil is going to be starting for the victims of Nova Scotia. And I think all of us are, I mean, we've had a hard time thinking about anything else. Like, I, I, my heart is so heavy. There's something about Nova Scotia in particular as well. Like, Nova Scotians are amazing. And um, some of my fondest memories are from being in Cape Breton. I have a friend who got married there and... Um, yeah, this is the last thing that anybody needed right now. And uh, yeah, so I think we'll all be watching the vigil t tonight. And then I think, I think hopefully, again, we're all trying to stay connected. And um, one of the things that I hope that we can do is like, again, love bomb our neighbors and love bomb the world however you can. And uh, the world needs more kindness and uh, and more listening and more understanding and more empathy and that's the way we're going to get through this so anyway I'm sending you all big love and uh you know reach out to me and if you guys have any questions uh about this or any need any reminders of prompts then reach out to me I'm, and I'm happy to to do my best to get back to you guys so love you lots have a great night have a great weekend bye you guys